And this is important. Um, so this is the ecosystem survey, um, ecosystem services update it's, uh, on the survey that, we've, that people have filled out or a lot of people have filled out. And what we're gonna do is provide a preliminary review of the results um, and then talk about them. So there'll be a couple of presentations that we're gonna do. Um, and, and one of these is um, one that um, Andrea actually, and I, and I heard it also, uh, we heard Brett Butler at the National SAF convention and he had a, a talk on ecosystem services and things that people provide. Well, uh, Jesse Caputo um, and Brett work in the Northern Research Station in FIA. And so, so we got Jesse to actually come on here and give a presentation on um, ecosystem services, farm, uh, farm forestry uh, owners um, uh, have. And, and so this is gonna be an interesting, uh, the reason why we're doing this is because he's gonna be providing um, a Washington state kind of summary or some information on Washington state um, uh, farm forestry owners and, um, uh, or forestry farm owners. And, um, and, and then we're gonna go into Washington Tree Farm Program's ecosystem survey update. So this is gonna kind of give a state view of like all landowners that own forest land. And I think Jesse's gonna say up to like one acre and above. And then we're gonna look at the survey results we have this Washington. So we may see some differences is, is what I'm saying. So this should be kind of interesting, I think. Um, what we're gonna do uh, with the Washington, um, with the survey update, um, is we're gonna do a purpose of the survey. We're gonna talk about how the survey was developed. We're gonna give her a summary of some of the results. Um, we have all the results here. So if other people have, have things that they wanna hear about what came, wh where are we at with a certain question, I'm just gonna do certain ones that I think highlight ones. And then what we're gonna do is we'll give a summary of those results. And then we're gonna open this thing up to questions and comments. And that's probably the most important part because we wanna hear what you think. Um, we want to hear um, things that are going. We're also going to talk about where this thing is going, what we plan to do with it. So all those things will be talked about today. So with that, I'm going to, so the first speaker today is going to be Jesse Caputo from the, uh, he's a research forester from the Forest Service Northern Station Forest Inventory and Analysis. And um, I'll let him talk about anything else about himself that he wants to talk about. But just talking to him here, he sounds like a really cool guy. All right, thank you, Bob. Um, can everyone hear me? I am going to be, where are we going? Okay, um, so uh, like Bob said, I'm gonna be giving a little overview here uh, on ecosystem services from family forests in Washington state. And so there's a lot of different definitions of ecosystem services out there and um, they all have a lot in common and they all have some differences, but to me, the important thing about ecosystem services is we're talking about um, aspects of ecosystems that produce human well-being. So we're talking about the human element of, of, uh, of forests, of, of ecosystems. Um, not to say that non-human elements don't matter, but um, why ecosystem services is different from other perspectives that we might bring to the table is that we are trying to focus on those things, those, those linkages um, between forests and ecosystems and, and human beings and, and human well-being. Um, and I'm, don't worry about this uh, big scary figure too much. Um, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that when we look at what aspects of forests um, bring value to people, um, we're looking at all different kinds of values. We are looking at use values. We are looking at non-use values. We're looking at things that are sort of consumptive uses and values, things like timber, things like game animals. Um, and we're also looking at recreation and uh, cultural values and research and education. Um, so there's a wide variety of ways that, that forests positively impact people. Um, and we're gonna be looking across um, many of these. So where did this work come from? Um, a few years ago, we published a little paper looking at ecosystem services on US family forests. Um, and the data come from 
um, the FIA National Woodland Donor Survey. And a, a couple of words about that. Um, as Bob mentioned, um, I work for the Forest Service. I'm a, I'm a researcher for the Forest Service. Um, and the FIA program, the Forest Inventory and Analysis Program, is the program that is charged with inventorying um, all aspects of U.S. forests across all ownership types. Um, and many of you are probably familiar with FIA's role in ground plots. We have ground plots all over private, public land. Um, we measure the trees. We're able to make estimates on things like volume and forest structure and uh, species diversity and all of that stuff. And that's kind of the product that we're most well known for. Um, but we don't just inventory the trees. We also inventory the landowners. And, and that's where my role really comes in. Um, the National Woodland Owner Survey is an annual survey of landowners in the United States, um, landowners that own at least one acre of woodland. Um, so that's the FIA definition of forest. It's one plus acres. Um, and so that's what we're talking about here. Um, and this paper a few years ago um, came from the 2013 cycle of the NWS. Um, and it was really a first attempt to take our survey and reframe it in using ecosystem services language. So understanding what we know about private forest landowners and how that um, produces values for, for people. But that's not what I'm talking about today. I'm going to be talking um, about a related um, uh, body of, of data that, that I pulled together for this group. Um, and, but it's going to be using the same methodology. And so what I'm going to be looking at today is landowners in Washington state um, that have taken the National Woodland Owner Survey um, and what we know therefore uh, about the ecosystem services that are being produced on their forests. Um, so this data comes from the 2018 cycle, um, which was released publicly a few years ago. Um, and we're looking at family forest ownerships. And family forest ownerships are defined as individuals, families, and trusts who own forest land. Um, there is a nice synergy between the FIA definition of family forests and the tree farm program in that it's, it's the program that is most representative, I would say, of family forest owners, small owners, as well as large owners, um, individuals, families who, who own land and, and want to participate in the program. So that's good. Um, but to reiterate what Bob said, it's not a synonymous group. So it's, there's not a random selection of landowners as part of Tree Farm. Um, tree Farm owners are different in different ways from just kind of your average um, random landowner in the state. So we are going to see some differences. Um, and just a little bit about the survey, we're looking at a sample size of 168 landowners um, that this data comes from. These are family forest landowners who own at least one plus acres. Um, and we had a 50.5 cooperation rate, which is really good. So this is fairly representative data that we're looking at here. Um, so we're, we're fairly comfortable with, with what we're talking about. Um, NWS estimates. So what are we? So what are we talking about with family forest landowners in Washington State? We're talking about two hundred thousand ownerships. Um, I should have asked ahead of time what your membership is, um, but in the state of Washington, we estimate that there are two hundred thousand ownerships owning one or more acres of, of forest land, um, and these ownerships own two point five million uh, million acres of land in the state, which is about ten percent of the forest land in the state. Um, by our estimates. And so ecosystem services. Um, I'm going to be showing a couple of figures. Um, one thing to note up front is that they all come from our online tool, um, the NWS dashboard. Um, I've thrown the, um, the URL up here. Um, if you are interested in knowing a wide variety of, of variables, a wide variety of metrics um, about landowners in your state, um, breaking this down by size of holdings, breaking it down by demographics. Um, please, you know, check out this tool. Um, everything I'm gonna be showing you today comes straight from that. Um, you'll be able to find out a lot more information uh, about your state. I'm only gonna be presenting a, a couple of data points. Um, so the first thing I'm going to be looking at is are again those consumptive services. So these are production of products um, that that benefit people from landowners in the state. And um, 
in the last five years, um, we are saying about 20% of FFOs in the state of Washington have produced um, cut or, or harvested trees for sale. Um, more than 50% have cut or removed trees for their own use. Um, again, somewhere in the area of 20% have collected non-timber forest products, um, and a little bit more than 20% have grazed livestock. Um, and this is fairly representative for the US. These numbers wouldn't differ too dramatically if you went to different states. Um, you know, the most important product that landowners are cutting for their own use is firewood. So a large percentage of that big bar there is firewood. A large percentage of, of landowners in, in Washington are, are producing firewood on their state. And firewood is pretty consistently one of the most important sort of consumptive products of, of privately owned forests in the US. Um, a lot of the non-timber forest products, the, the, the largest category in Washington state, according to our survey is edibles. Um, but also um, medicinal products, uh, decorative floral products, those, those are all important too. Um, we don't break down livestock raising um, more than just livestock raising. So I don't know um, what that is primarily in your state, if that's, you know, the, it's usually cattle or sheep in most states um, or some mixture of the two. Um, but these four categories are kind of the main representation of, of those consumptive services. Um, and another thing to point out here is that in some states, leasing of forest land, so um, not just harvesting your products for yourself or for the market, but actually leasing your land to other people who graze cattle or collect things or, or graze is, is very popular. Um, but we don't find that it is especially popular in Washington state. So less than 1% of landowners um, are, are leasing their land. So it's kind of a negligible category of services. Most people that are producing services are doing it um, themselves or they are directly hiring the, the folks that are doing it. Um, so another major category of services that we're gonna be talking about today are recreational services. So recreational services are um, a major element of those non-consumptive services, um, a major element of um, the kind of uh, non-productive or, or non-provisioning services. And if you look at this figure, what you see is that almost three quarters of landowners um, recreate on their own land. Um, and then a large percent of, percentage of them, you know, more than 50% of them, their children recreate on the land. Um, close to 50% of them, they have other family recreating on their land. Um, friends and neighbors are also uh, very popular, um, but you see almost nothing for the general public. So we see a pattern that we see in a lot of states where the beneficiaries, the people who are uh, uh, benefiting from the recreational services are the owners and what we call the close associates of the owners. It's not, you know, people from down the road. It's not, you um, the, the public either for, from, for free or for, for a fee, as we say sometimes. Um, and that we also see that about 25% of people, nobody recreates on the land. So even though recreation is one of the most um, uh, pervasive ecosystem services that we see, a full quarter of people uh, are reporting that, um, that no one is using their land for recreation. And what are these folks doing? Well, the most, um, popular um, by far is hiking and walking, um, biking, camping, um, horseback riding, and, and off-road vehicles. Those are all those are all um, fairly popular. So these kind of non-consumptive, uh, passive recreational activities are very popular. Um, hunting and fishing are interesting in that hunting and fishing are they're recreational, um, but they're also consumptive. So it's a little of both. Um, you know, if you, you shoot a deer on your land, you're certainly getting recreational value out of that, but you're getting a good amount of meat um, as well. And the same is true for, for fishing. Um, so, you know, these are kind of the figures, what we're seeing here, you know, something around 20 to 25% are doing timber, are doing 
um, grazing, are doing non-timber forest products, biking, camping, horseback riding, this kind of 20 to 25% number is, is fairly pervasive, but we see a couple of services that are much higher than that. So hiking and firewood being the big two that are well over 50% of, of landowners are getting those values uh, from their land. Um, and then just a couple of thoughts about the NWS and, and what else we're looking at and, and um, uh, how we're going forward. So I've talked to you today largely about direct use values. And if we want to put a number on these, um, something like 75% based on, this is kind of summarizing all of those bars and the graphs I showed you earlier, something like 75% of ownerships are producing at least one consumptive service and about 75% of land ownerships are producing at least one non-consumptive um, service. So three quarters of landowners in Washington state are producing non-direct uh, uh, use values. That's a big number. Um, but what the NWS can't tell us about is some of these other values, is some of these option values and uh, bequest and philanthropic values. And I won't get into all of these right here. Um, this is just a plug to say that the, we do have a, a, um, a science module, a new survey that we're working on right now that asks landowners about some of these values. So in some future at some future time, I'll be able to say something about um, these other values and, and how pervasive they are in Washington state. Um, and then, you know, there's also this indirect use value. These are what's sometimes called regulating services. These are things like carbon sequestration and water regulation and pest control and pollination and all these other great things that we know our forests do and a large proportion of forests um, provide these values. Um, but they're not necessarily things that landowners would always know about, and they're not things where awareness of them necessarily correlates with their existence. So we can't really survey people about these. Um, we are looking at other approaches to kind of estimate these, whether that's looking at the plot value or the, the plot data or, or something else. Um, but that, that's a very different kind of value. Um, so a couple, again, of broad conclusions. Three quarters of Washington family owners are producing consumptive services. A similar proportion of family forest owners are producing non-consumptive services. Um, these are direct use values. Um, most ecosystem services benefit landowners and their friends, family, and neighbors. And again, this is something we see in most states as well. These are kind of the primary beneficiaries of landowners. It's not necessarily um, public values, although those exist, I'm not trying to um, water down that message, but um, quantitatively, the largest proportion of ecosystem services are kind of coming back to the landowners and their friends, family, and neighbors. Um, but on the other hand, 20% of um, family forest landowners produced services for the market or for the general public in the last five years. So this is not a trivial amount by any means um, over a five year window to say that, um, you know, across all the land, all across all the forest landowners in the state, um, a full fifth of them are producing public services every five years. Um, and then again, to mention woodlands, uh, leasing woodlands to other users and beneficiaries does not seem to be a prevalent um, uh, activity across all landowners um, in the state. That may be one of those things that is, is different among your membership. Um, and that finally, um, non-use and indirect use values are not currently well represented by the NWS. We have new survey instruments that we're working on and, and new approaches that we're working on that are gonna try to uh, hit some of these a little bit more um, uh, more thoroughly, but um, right now th those services are not kind of captured by, by our data. And that, that's what I've got. Well, thank you, Jesse. Are there, are there questions for Jesse? Um, you can either, I think we have a small enough group, I think there's only like about 15 on here. You could unmute and ask a question or you could type it into the chat box. I had a question for Jesse. Hi, Tom. 
Yeah, you know, and it's not surprising that the uh, general public recreation is, you know, almost non-existent. We, we kind of know that and we're relying so much on just the public sector to provide that. And I've always thought that was a huge um, opportunity in the future. And, um, and so I don't know, I mean, to me, it just seems like liability and some of the government regulations if you were doing something, that is the issue. And I didn't know if anybody's, you know, trying to look at that because it just seemed like that would be a huge benefit, both financially for the landowner and um, and not rely so much on the public sector to provide parks and everything. So it, um, it's not surprising, but I wish there was something uh, we could do to maybe change that. Yeah, that you know, it's a great question and a great point. Um, I don't, I don't have any great answers um, except to say that public recreation on private land is one of these things that that varies across the country, and I think it has a lot to do with sort of local traditions, and so those things don't change quickly. Um, you know, there are parts of the country where, you know, in New England, where I'm from. Um, public recreation or public recreation on private lands is is relatively common um, for free. So the charging here is very uncommon. And then there's other parts of the country like the Lake States and the South where charging people to go onto your land, whether it's for hunting or camping or different things is, is more common. Um, but again, those are just sort of, these are kind of longstanding traditional elements. And I think you're right about, you know, you've got this giant, great public resource and it's right outside everyone's backyard, basically. Um, so you're in a sense competing with that. And if you don't have this tradition of, of um, private or, you know, public recreation on private lands, it's not something I, I feel like you're going to find a real easy answer to change quickly, but it is a huge opportunity. You're right. And if there's ways to start um, scraping away at that, whether it's, you know, an information campaign or, or something like that. I, I, I think it's one of those things where you have to start somewhere, but, um, but that, that's a great point and a great question. So, um, Jesse, with regard to um, going from one acre plus, is there some break at which, like, you know, one acre, if someone owns one acre of forest land, versus say, you know, 20 or 10 or five, um, is there a difference in the use that in types of uses? And have you looked they, at that? We've, we've looked quite a bit at this. It's, a, it's one of these questions that's really interesting. So in the, in the, we often will report our numbers with 10 plus. 10 plus is a very common number. Lots of programs have 10 plus. It's kind of lots of foresters across the country have this you know, 10 acres number in their head as being, you know, the point at which, you know, the things start to get a little bit more real. But when we've looked at the data, it varies really dramatically on what you're talking about. So what service, what activity, what program, you know, what aspect, we actually did a, um, a paper a few years ago that I, I can, I'll share it with you guys after the fact, but we, we looked at this and how do things change with size of holdings. And one of our hypotheses was, all right, we're going to find, you know, maybe it won't be exactly 10, but maybe it'll be somewhere around 7 to 15, where you see this, this kind of marked change in behavior, because everyone's kind of always assumed that. And what we found was actually very different, that the number at which behavior changed for some things was didn't exist. For some things, it was at one or two acres. For some things, it was at 10. For some things, it was hundreds of acres. So, um I don't, I don't think it's as easy to characterize landowners with this one number for everything as people have maybe said in the past. It's, it's a complex, uh, there's a complex relationship with, with the amount of land people own and what they do and think and say. Yeah, it, it's interesting because, I mean, just being involved with tree farm um, and, and going out on tree farms, what I notice is there's there's somewhat of a difference in the in the kind of intensity of management. Um, I think actually Nick mentioned it once. Uh, if you have a person that owns ten acres, they really just know every single tree, and they, and they know what they're going to do. And whereas if you have five hundred acres, 
there's a different intensity. That doesn't mean there's a difference in care or, or you know, management or sustainable forestry. It just means there's a difference in how they, the intensity at which they look at things and, yeah. and, and, their, and their land. And so that's why I was curious about like one acre. Is that a point where, where okay, yeah, I know where everything is and it doesn't really change anything and I can't really provide anything. So I just leave it. But anyways, it's just an interesting question. Yeah, and I think with the ecosystem services angle too, it's going to vary a lot. So someone with one acre can hike or camp on their land just as easily as someone with hundreds of acres. But, you know, when it comes to doing commercial harvest, there might be some complications, some problems, some roadblocks, some difficulties with doing that if you only own an acre. So maybe there is a difference. So it, it, it you know, like I said, it just it depends entirely on, on what it is that you're looking at. Yes. Okay, other questions for Jesse? Nick's got a question. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Jesse. Um, I'm just curious, it's kind of a bit, bit of a selfish, but as a service forester, do you see an acreage threshold at, at a certain point where people actually engage in professional forestry services? Um, it remains low until a fairly high acreage. And I don't have the numbers offhand, but I mean, even, even hundreds of acres, um, I would say it's probably less common than common. Um, there is some point and it's up in the thousands where you know it becomes pretty certain that somebody has someone. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, and again, it varies by area, by, by a lot of other things, but um, yeah, I, I mean, through the, through the, the bulk of kind of the distribution of landowners, it's, uh, it's not common by any means. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, you said that 20% of landowners one acre lodger actually sold something off their property. What, what kind of things are you including in that? Um, that seems awful high to me in, in the last five years. So that's timber for others' use. Um, the, that, that's a the mix of three variables. That's timber for other people's use. That is um, grazing, or that is um, non-timber forest products for other people's use. And, and it is uh, just just to kind of add, at least here I know that that if you have a five acre block and you've, you've bought say five acres and you're going to put a house on I know usually the first thing that happens with that in a lot of cases is people will try to sell the timber at least some of it off of there um, and, and so so there is that could be in part of that twenty percent too because that does happen quite a bit. Yeah, and, and the other thing to keep in mind is that's a percent of ownership. So it doesn't say anything about magnitude. Right. So if, if a landowner answered that survey because they sold one log or one basket of ferns or you know the neighbor ran three cows on the land or something and gave them $50, then that would still constitute a yes. So we, that's something we just don't know about magnitude. That's not something we can easily ask and easily quantify. Okay, cool. I think, Jesse, I think you're going to hang around for the rest of this. So, um, I will. And because um, we'd really appreciate it. And, um, but why don't we move on to um, what I think you all came here for? But I thought that was fascinating. I, I, I think that's really cool. And actually, I saw a lot of similarities. So, uh, and I realize there's some differences too. So, so what we're going to talk about now is, is the second part of this is the uh, tree farm ecosystem survey update. We're going to just talk about the purpose, how the survey was developed, summary results, and then open question and answer period. So here we go. So what's the purpose of this survey? What, why are we doing this? And, and so a lot of reasons uh, for doing that. But, you know, the first one is to communicate everything that we do. Um, we do a lot of things. This is uh, tree farms are a complex operation, even though a lot of times we think each thing is simple in itself. Um, to actually do the variety of things that we want to do takes a lot. And so to communicate those kind of things and then the things we actually provide. And to provide understanding, which really fits into that, um, we, are, we are in tree farm. We do an amazing amount of things. We provide a lot of things. Um, so that's important. And, and by doing those first two, and the third part, we want to gain support from, first of all, communities um, so the people around us, so that they understand what we're trying to do. I know that I work a lot with master gardeners, 
who really don't have an understanding of what a person who owns land, what they really do. Well, I guess they're just trying to get logs or they're just trying to get money into the, the stream, which is true. But they don't understand a lot of times all the aspects of wildlife and, and water and wood and recreation that, that they actually provide, even though on a weekend they may go, hey, uh, Joe or Harriet, can I, can I go walk on your land or can I pick mushrooms there this weekend? So it's, it's to kind of get the communities to understand a lot of that. And it's to better quantify what we do as a program. So I know each of you with your tree farms are doing amazing things within your tree farm. But I think what's interesting in the survey is it shows this whole array of different things that we do on a landscape that goes from the, you know, the entire state, from the east side to the west side, from the wet coast um, to, the, to the dry end um, up in you know, the high desert kind of country. So there's, there's a lot of things and we wanna quantify what are those things that we do? Um, uh, next thing is, is helping gain support for future legislation. Um, this state is, looks like it's going into a big, being a big supporter of, of doing things to prevent you know, climate from getting too warm or, or too cold or whatever they, you know, they end up being. But, but the point is um, we want to make them understand that we are doing a lot of things and we work in ecosystems if you think about it. Again, we work in almost every single um, general low to moderate elevation um, ecosystem that you can have in the state. So it, we, have, we have tree farms in all those places. Um, and then the other part of it is, uh, which I find interesting is we're always talking about the history of the tree farm program and we're trying to put together things, but this is an opportunity to understand what we do now and understand how those things will change over time. So in in uh, in a hundred years, when you know when you're you know generations into the future, your family can can understand what you were trying to do, what the things you were trying to do, and we can see how those things change, which I think is a really cool thing. And then and then finally, um, we want to so we want to provide a historical record, um, and and but we want to um, we want to be able to emphasize the services we provide. Um, but also maintain the things we're doing and, and these sort of services sustainably. So we want to emphasize those services that we have. The other part of this in the survey is it's really important to maintain anonymity so that we don't want, you know, an individual tree farmer to think that, oh my God, you know, someone's going to get my information or whatever like that. Well, we want to, we want to aggregate things up so that we can understand it, um, but not, not um, take away the private, private thoughts that people have on their land. So anyways. So who's been involved? Well, I think they're all online um, and all of you probably are, have taken the survey. So John Hendrickson and Nick Koontz and Andrew Watts, they're, they're the brains of the operation. I've kind of just helped with typing and, and trying to do these different things, but, but uh, and hopefully I've added a thing or two. But, but those are the, really the four key people. They're made up of tree farmers, foresters uh, the, in that group. And there's also many tree farmers who have helped us in this survey talking to us, trying to go over the, the surveys, trying to um, go, how can you make this question better? So there's been a whole bunch of things that have gone on. Is somebody have a question? Okay. Survey development. Um, it started um, with, uh, uh, was developed based on some things that we found in the current literature about ecosystem services. We brought together um, the four of us, uh, which you know made up of foresters and tree farmers, and we helped develop the question based on quantifying ecosystem services um, considered in the standards. So we use the standards that we have in the program, and we link those to the kinds of services that um, we found that generally people provide. Um, the current standards were utilized to assure the questions were in line with current standards requirements. The standards were tested utilizing uh, tree farmers from both the east side and the west side of the state. Although I will say that it's, it's probably more significantly to the west side, but we're hoping that as, this, uh, as we continue to, to ask for more uh, people to, to, to do this survey, we're hoping that we'll get a better support from the east side. But we do have, we do have quite a few from the east side at this point. Uh, platforms were utilized or free to minimize costs of doing the survey. So a lot of things we've done on here are, um, are based on things that were cheap so none of this is really costing a lot of money. It's taking um, all of us are volunteers 
Um, so, so basically, uh, the cost of doing this is relatively small at this point, other than maybe some cost for publicizing or, or publication. Uh, a little talking points paper uh, I, that may cost a little bit or something, editing, things like that. Um, survey results or maintain anonymity of tree farmers by um, sharing results in aggregate. So again, um, that, that should not be a fear of anybody that we are, we are trying to do our best uh, within that. So here's the preliminary results. Here we go. So far we received 79 and it may be 80 now uh, uh, from a total of about 660 tree farms within the state program. Um, results reflect a, a large range of acreages from 10 to several thousand acres. Um, current responses lean more towards west side tree farmers, which I talked about. So here's some following of the earlier some uh, following of some earlier results. So I'm going to go through basically examples of the four pillars: uh, timber, water, wildlife, and recreation. So um, I'm going to go through those, and then after that, um, I will bring up uh, all the questions and the survey questions. So if there's one that I missed or one that you wanted to hear about, I can pull that up. So timber. So uh, what, one of the questions in there was, is ongoing or potential timber production one of your management goals? 88% of you, 88.6% of you said, yes, that is one of my timber management goals. 11% basically said no, um, that it's not a main goal. Now that, that can be a lot of things. They could still be in that class. They could still be looking at um, timber production to a certain degree, but they may be emphasizing other, other, other uh, services within that. So like, for example, for wildlife, they may say that, well, actually, I'm going to do this sale to uh, develop some kind of wildlife habitat. So they may do something like that. So it may be part of the thing, but it may not be included in there. And that may be what the 11% is all about. Um, we can't really tell that from, from the question. Um, management techniques are, are that, that people are using were, was kind of interesting, um, I thought, anyways. Um, 62% of the people are using even age management across the state. Um, uneven age management, we're only at about 35%. Um, but what's more interesting in that is that um, if you look at this, if you look at this slide here, even age management actually on the side, we actually have um, people who are um, looking at uh, using uneven age management on the west side, which I was kind of surprised at. Um, or, or actually 19 on the west side, I'm sorry. And um, seven um, on the east side are using uneven age management, which, which could be expected. Um, that's to be expected, but the high number on the west side is actually kind of interesting, um, which, which says there, there may be other goals in there. Um, so can anybody guess what the top Silvicultural practices are, no, we can I guess the number one um, silvicultural practice used to maximize timber production is? Uh, any thoughts? Maximize timber production or quality? Okay, you're not gonna play. All right, all right. Thinning is the number one, number one treatment that's used to maximize timber production and quality. Can anybody guess number two? Okay, it's, it's uh, manual vegetation control, mechanical. Number three is pruning. Number four is animal damage control. Number five is fertilization. Other activities that have been have been uh, identified in this are burning, burning, interplanting, uh, improving access, mixed species management. So there's a number of things that are going on. Now, one of the things I want you to think about in, in when you look at this is that who we're trying to who we're trying to communicate to, and that's like publics, uh, other tree farmers, uh, legislators, people. That's there is a number of this. This shows the work that's involved to maximize timber production. And these are the things that we use. And, and yes, they are probably common. I'm sure that most of you would have guessed the first one, right, if you would have answered. But um, the thinning was, was certainly done. But all of these things show 
an extreme amount of time, money, and calculation. Um, you don't just thin to thin, you thin with a goal. Uh, it might be a spacing, it might be to maximize growth on individual trees, it may be to maximize growth um, on a stand of trees, it may be to um, have multiple objectives um, in timber production to maximize timber production within a wildlife habitat objective. All of those things may be possible. So when you're going through this, these are the things that we can use that we can show people, this is what we're doing. Um, this is an interesting one um, in that it's, um, it's the question of when, when is timber um, harvesting planned or scheduled? And you notice um, it's kind of interesting that uh, it goes from zero to five years all the way up to 51 plus years. And, and what's interesting about that is it's almost like a sustained yield kind of um, scenario that's going on here. So zero to five years, those are going to grow up to be 51. Uh, 51 year olds may be cut. Um, and so the percentages, so as a land base, this doesn't exactly say it, but it certainly does look like that. But it's a fairly interesting slide, I thought. Um, if you are conducting ongoing harvest, do you use a professional forester? Do you work with a professional forester? Um, this is an interesting question, and, and I'm not sure we asked, asked this one quite right, but it is interesting that 80% of the people say they use a professional forester, and 20% say they don't. Now, what's interesting about that is John uh, Hendrickson actually mentioned that in, in, uh, in, in, in the last time. He said, he said, well, I've never actually... Um, uh, hired a professional forester to do anything, but I talk to professional foresters all the time. So you may talk to a DNR forester, you may talk to a service forester, you may talk to a consultant on the side, um, you may talk to a fellow forester that, that owns a tree farm, uh, but, but you don't actually, um, uh, you don't actually have, you don't actually work closely with a professional forester other than to get their ideas. So there may be some noise in this, this slide, but anyways, 80% um, of, of uh, tree farmers are actually using uh, professional foresters to do, to do work on their property, and 20% aren't. So any questions on timber? Okay. Um, Non-timber forest products or special forest products. Um, basically, are you managing, uh, this one was surprising, I thought, to me anyways, that actually, um, over just over 50% are actually managing for non-timber forest products. Um, it seems like most people I talk to generally are concentrating on, you know, the timber, the timber aspects of the thing, and they aren't really concerned that or consider they don't really consider all those things like salal and those kinds of things. Um, but it is interesting that that in here it says that they do. So obviously they must. Um, is the management of these projects in your management plan? 67.5% of the people say yes. So that's that again. It shows, it shows that these two slides show that the consideration for those other products is also considered. Um, so again, if you're looking at managing for those, you're looking at managing those sustainably over time. So that's, I think that's an important, important one. Um, so top five products that are being managed for on tree farms. Can anybody guess what number one is? Okay, firewood is number one. And I think uh, Jesse brought that up in his presentation that firewood is the number one uh, special forest product that's a uh, manager identified for on tree farms. Two, floral products such as boughs and shrubs, which again would be expected um, on, on both the west side and the east side. Mushrooms, um, obviously that's a big one. Um, things like morels on the east side, chanterelles on the west side. Um, I know that a lot of tree farmers do um, look to see if they have those and they try to maintain them. And four is edib edible vegetation such as berries. Other products such as pine needle seeds were, were also mentioned um, as, as a kind of a fifth. Other products that were listed trees, cascara barks, cattle. So again, if you look at the big picture of this, these are some of the things that we're providing um, 
to society and to the state um, as part of as part of uh, sustainable forestry. Top four management techniques used to manage for these products. Anybody guess what number one is? I know somebody's going to surprise me and, and, and come up with one here, but okay. Uh, number one is thinning. Number two is planting. Um, and, and that's in the case of with planting, if you're planting things like noble fir for boughs, uh, things like that. Um, doing site prep. Uh, various kinds of site prep um, that could be in the, I mean, like if you're looking for morels, the idea of burning, under burning or something like that can always bring out a, a fine crop of, of morels in a lot of places on the east side. Uh, burning. And so those are the top four. Others that were mentioned were grazing, removal of invasive species, stream rehabilitation, harvesting, and pruning. Okay, here's, here's another kind of interesting one. Do you currently sell these species, uh, these species of non-timber forest products commercially, or are you considering selling non-timber forest products in the future? Um, it was fairly interesting that 40% um, 40, 40 are actually selling them now, um, and, and another 20% are considering to sell them in the future. Um, uh, and, and, not, and, and then 40% are not, not, not currently selling or uh, no intention to sell in the future. This seems to fit pretty well, but again, it shows that we are we are understanding what we have and we are trying to move, move forward with it. Okay, any questions on special forest products? Anything you think we might have would have missed? Anything you see in there that seems odd? Anything like that? If you have them later, that's great too. Okay, recreation. Um, do you have recreational opportunities on your tree farm that are available to your farm or the public? 83% um, of the people basically said, yes, we do. And 16% said, no, we really don't have any recreational opportunities. Um, who are, and and the, the key to this one is, um, which I found interesting, it was a little bit different from what um, Jesse had, I think. Um, Family and friends certainly is, is, the, big, is the big one, it's 95.5%, but also 24.2% um, actually made them available to the public, um, which, which again, I think is interesting. Although I know that at least on the west side of the state and in some places on the east side of the state, I know there is a significant thing during the, say the mushrooming season and people that like to pick mushrooms for recreation, I know that they ask landowners if they can do that. Um, and also there's things like hiking, um, I know that there's a significant amount of that going on. I think John Kingsbury told me once that uh, this is just a little side story that he was talking about these people. They saw him um, working with his cat up on his tree farm, which was adjacent to a, a housing development. And people started getting get really concerned and going up, what are you doing wrecking our natural area? And, and so these people actually had been using this for hiking and whatever. And, and John had to convince them that, no, this is my property. And actually... Um, so I thought that was that was kind of kind of funny. But um, how far away are family, friends, and public who visit your tree farm? Within ten miles, um, about fifty six percent. Twenty five to fifty miles, uh, fifty about fifty percent, and uh, greater than fifty miles, again about uh, uh, fifty fifty three percent are are coming from long distances. So again, this starts to talk about those things that that. And in a lot of cases, um, you know, you will say that, well, he has family members coming from a distance and they may come to visit or whatever, but, but still it's allowing an opportunity um, for people, for a service that we provide to, to a variety of people. Top six recreational opportunities that tree farmers provide across the state. One is uh, wildlife viewing um, in, in this, in, at least so far in our survey. Two is hiking. Three is foraging for mushrooms. Four is hunting. Five is camping. Six is educational opportunities, which I, again, I think this is really neat. Now I hear this a lot, um, that a lot of people utilize their tree farm if a school wants to use it um, to, to do some training for their students or whatever, or uh, uh, farm uh, FFA, 
Um, if they are future farmers of America, a lot of times they have a forestry requirement. Um, this is where you can provide ed educational opportunities. This is an amazing thing that we do um, um, for, for creating that opportunity. Other important opportunities include um, on biking, fishing, skiing, and snowshoes and ecotourism. You know, this one, this one is particularly important in the state um, for places that are isolated from the national forests or DNR lands. So when you go over towards the coast, for example, there's a lot of people that will use private lands for recreation because it's close and, and they can use it. So I think that's an important thing that we provide um, uh, within, within the tree farm program. So any questions on recreation? Okay, um, let's go to water. Do you own wetlands or streams on your property? 84 or 85% of the people say yes. 15% uh, basically don't, don't have any. How many miles of uh, stream or river do you have on your property? Um, most people have less than a mile, but some have as, as much as one to five miles. So that's, that's, that's probably a fairly big tree farm and that's, that's pretty amazing. And then 12% say more than, more than five miles. So again, this probably comes to the larger acreage, but it does exist. So again, if you look at this, we, we, have, a lot of, we have a lot of streams and rivers that we're help, helping to protect, to buffer, to improve, um, those kind of things. Top six management techniques that are being used to enhance carbon, uh, enhance water resources on your tree farm. One is the planting of conifers. Two is noxious weed control. Three, density management. Um, four, um, this was an interesting one, encouraging beaver activity, um, which, which I think, again, when you're when you're looking at this from the perspective of of uh, the publics and you're looking at, at legislatures, we're utilizing the natural things that are there to actually help us to manage a resource wisely. We're also using um, techniques that will improve that, like planting of conifers or noxious weed control. So all of those come at a cost. So it's an amazing amount of things that we do. And as I've been going through this, every time I go through it, I recognize how many things we actually do and the work that goes into to actually bringing that together, which I think is really important when you're trying to sell something uh, to the public or trying to show that you're actually managing your forest sustainably and you're able to do it. And these are the techniques that have to have to be used. Um, again, I have plenty of conifers twice, sorry. Um, increasing the buffer size um, is another one. Other activities um, include things like restoring historic uh, stream channels, channel reconstruction, maintenance of dams. So there's, there's a number of things. Once again, this just shows all the different things that we're doing to help out. In a lot of cases, um, uh, that, that people are working with uh, the DNR, they're working with a lot of people to actually try and restore these things, and they're giving their time and their effort into making that happen. And I think that's really important. Again, when I think about all the things that I've talked about so far, Think about the complexity of the things that you do every day, even though they may seem simple in themselves, and I know you'll say they're a lot of work, but I'm gonna say that they're not only hard work, but they also, they also take an amazing amount of complex thought in order to manage these forests sustainably. And it's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing uh, group that, that we have doing that. So that's, that's kind of it for um, what I've got. Um, oh, I, excuse me, I think I, okay, I still not finished yet, sorry. Okay, anything else on, uh, oh, well, one other thing within, um, within this one is Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, how many uh, people are actually enrolled in one? There's about 87% of the people are enrolled in one, which, which again, I think is, is really great. So they're involved, they're interacting, with the programs that exist in order to maintain sustainable forestry. I think this is an amazing selling point. Uh, wildlife. This one I think is an interesting um, kind of just, just graphic in that it shows the variety of different 
stand type conditions that we are working in. Everything from hardwood dominated riparian areas to older conifer dominated forests. It's, it's really amazing. We also have, in a lot of cases, we have oak species that are in decline. Well, we're also helping with that. Uh, we also have a habitats that are within that. Forested meadows, edges, we're doing a lot of things. If you look at the percentage of people that are actually working in these areas. Now, again, each individual tree farm may not have all of these things, but as a group, this is a selling point because we go again from the coast all the way to the Canadian border, all the way down to the Columbia River, all the way over to you know Spokane and Idaho. So this is an amazing uh, display of areas that we're working in or types, various forest types. A couple of things within this that I think are really important that I think are important to tree farm is that. This is where the ideas are generated. One of the fascinating things, and I worked for the Forest Service for 35 years, um, and one of the things that I've noticed here is the amazing amount of ideas that come out of this because you have individuals who are actually thinking out these things themselves and you come out with amazing ideas um, and new ideas. Um, and I, I use the example of Tom Westergreen when we were at uh, Chuck Higgins' kind of award thing where he kind of came up with this very simplistic way to uh, protect uh, seedlings uh, cheaply. And he actually was able to you know, move this thing on and off really quickly, this netting really quickly. And, and that's just an example. We're working in each of these different, different types and we're actually making them work. And we are coming up with new ideas. And, and certainly in some cases, they may be more costly, they may take more time, but that's out of that out of that ingenuity comes invention and becomes the future. And I think that's where we're really important to um, uh, to to people like that are in legislature, to communities, to let them know we are working in these areas and we're doing things and we're coming up with new things. Um, are you are you managing or investing to develop wildlife habitat? Um, Sixty three percent said yes. Thirty um, again, that's an amazing number. So we are investing in all of that stuff. And I would contend that most people that probably said no to this question at some point probably say, well, I'm creating habitat just by what I'm doing. There may not be an intention for a specific kind of wildlife, but, but there, is, there is an intent there. So I think, again, this is a really amazing selling point. Um, any questions on wildlife? Okay, hunting and fishing. Um, do you provide opportunities for hunting and fishing? 55% uh, say yes. So again, pretty, pretty amazing. We're providing opportunities. Um, who do you allow, who do they allow it for? Uh, again, uh, uh, most of it is family and friends, certainly, but there's neighbors. Neighbors, uh, again, that's an important component. As you all know, in Western and even Eastern Washington, populations are increasing and people, there's more people around, more neighbors that you have. So more people are looking for those opportunities. And also uh, about 20% are doing leases and uh, leases or permits. Top three hunting and fishing opportunities. Big game is number one, of course, elk and deer. Fishing, um, it's, it's an amazing amount that we have in this state. Game fowl, so pheasants, uh, chuckers, all those kinds of things. Okay, uh, anything on hunting and fishing? Okay, jump to carbon. Are you presently enrolled or interested in enrolling in a carbon program? 80% or 70% of you basically said uh, um, that, um, that you are interested um, and uh, it doesn't look like anybody is currently enrolled in a carbon program. Um, and there's about 29% of you said that you're not interested in enrolling in a carbon program. Um, of the acreage that you're considering uh, enrolling, what are the age distribution of the trees? Uh, this basically shows that a lot of them are in the zero to 20 range, some are in the 21 to 40. Uh, 41 to 80 uh, is another uh, fairly, fairly large group and 81 plus. And that kind of fits with uh, generally the way we harvest and schedules and rotation ages that, that we work in. So I would expect that to be somewhat, somewhat true. Four things that trees are doing, uh, tree farmers are doing to enhance or increase carbon storage. One, they're doing active forest management. That's a general term, but, but again, it includes a lot of the things that we've talked about. 
um, longer managing for longer rotation age. That seems to be a big one that people are talking about in this day and age. Aforestation. Um, there's a lot of that. I've heard a lot of that going on. I've seen people that are doing that um, and tree farmers that are doing that. Moving towards old growth characteristics. This is an interesting one, but I think this one I'm starting to see more as tree farmers are changing hands to going to the family members. A lot of people are talking more towards doing these kinds of things. Okay, so that's that's kind of goes through kind of the four pillars and, and kind of some things going on. I'm open to all the other things that I'll, I'll pull that up next if you want. But um, so some of the current takeaways um, from these results that I think are important for others to know, or we think that are important for others to know. Managing tree farms is an active and requires complex thinking and with active leadership. And I know most of you would say, I, I don't know about that. It actually is. It's a very complex, it's a very complex operation in order to move these things. You're doing two things. Number one, you're thinking as a tree farmer, what do I need to do today um, to keep my forest sustainable and maybe to remove products or whatever, but also you're thinking about that future generation. And so I know that we have some tree farms in this state that have been around for five generations. Well, I think those people really need to be commended. They've done it. I mean, they are they are doing it and they are managing to keep this in, in, for, in forest. And with the amount of development and the breaking up of lands, I think that's an important, uh, important statement. Important to remember too, as individual tree farms, not everyone provides every service. But if you look at this and you look at what I've kind of talked about up to this point, you look at what everybody's, uh, what everybody's providing together and together as a group, we are doing an amazing thing. So each of us individually are doing good things and coming up with new ideas. But what's really important is that as a group across the state, um, north, south, east and west, we are providing a lot of things to the, to the state. We provide management on a broad array of forest ecosystems across the state um, with representation of most forest types, everything from the pine forest to the Sitka spruce forest to the Doug fir hemlock forest, all those things. Um, we are providing uh, a lot of management in those things. So that's really important. I think that's an important takeaway from what we've seen so far. Um, <clears throat> tree farmers are providing opportunities at, at many levels for public interaction. You saw that slide about, you know, we're 20 percent. We're allowing publics to, to, to utilize our lands. So, so we're providing those opportunities and we're providing to family members and, and to neighbors and all those kinds of things. We're doing some pretty amazing things. We provide a wide array of ecosystem services. I haven't gone into all the questionnaire, the whole questionnaire, because there's really not time to do that, but, but it does show the number of things that we're actually providing and, and all of you should be quite proud. Next steps, um, we, need, we want to get more people to complete the survey. So we're going to continue to work more towards that goal. And um, our, first, our first real goal is to get as many as before the end of, of December so that we can get together a talking points paper uh, for the legislative session, but we would like to, we'd like to pull that together. Um, we need to know what you would like to know from the survey. So what you've seen and what I've talked about is certainly all important and, and good. There are other things in it. Um, what would you like to know um, from the survey? Um, so that's an important thing as we summarize things that we can provide a format that you would like. Survey is still open. I talked about that. Um, if, if someone is, is on here that hasn't done it yet, doesn't have the link, we can get that link to them. Um, we're developing a talking point report um, for the legislative session. I talked about that. Uh, we want to develop a database to store information, to track services we provide. And I, and I talked about this earlier. The important thing for Tree Farm is, is can we begin to store this information before it's lost so that, so that we can really look to the future so that, again, we have, if, if when all of the people who are now at one generation are, are get to five generations, we can know how things have changed and we can follow that and we can show, um, we can show legislators, we can show communities how we have maintained this over a long period of time. And these are the things we're doing and these are how we've changed. These are things that have stayed the same. I think that's a really cool, cool point. So with that, I'm gonna shut up.
and um, I'm going to open it up for questions. And the, and the questions that I'm really that we're really asking that the four of us wanted to get out, and and Nick and John and Andrea jump in at any point. What we're really trying to get is we're trying to get um, an understanding of what you would like to see from this survey. What what you what you think of the survey so far? Um, do you think we're headed in the right direction with what we're doing? Um, and it, it's interesting after listening to Jesse's, it seems like we're following a lot of the things that they've been looking at. Um, there was, uh, we, we don't, I mean, the plan is not to, to share the database or any information other than an aggregate. Um, so, so, that, so those are the kinds of things we need to know. Or, or if you just have comments, I, we'd like to hear them. This is being recorded. So if you have questions, you can type them in the chat box or you can ask them, ask them. And if we don't answer them today, we will um, answer them uh, at another point. And we have about 25 minutes left. And so I'm gonna open it up for you guys. And then uh, John and Andrea, first let me ask John and Andrea and, um, and Nick if they have any additional comments they'd like to share. Because there is, I'm just, I'm just the spokesman here for this presentation. So do you guys have anything to add? Yeah, I'll jump, this is John Hendrickson. I'll jump in real quick. Um, another takeaway I would like to add to that great list you put together there is um, just how well this survey shows what gets involved in in creating these services as kind of a counter to the, the kind of prevailing narrative that if you just do nothing and walk away, it'll all magically provide everything that you want. And uh, this really underlines the fact that, as you say, there's a, quite a bit of investment and thought and cost involved in a really conscious process to uh, individually target ecosystem services and multiple ones at the same time. So that I, that I think that's one of the greatest benefits of this in, in our outreach to the public to communicate why we did this and what its value is. Good point. Yeah, I'd like to add, um, you know, for folks, um, this may not have been, you know, at the fore of their mind or they may have been thinking about it. A lot of other uh, organizations have been, you know, kind of devising schemes but one of the values that I think this uh, process provides is it helps people kind of get organized and take stock of what they have relative to what some of these um, different payment schemes might offer. And so you are in a better position, I think, when you go through this and kind of wrap your head around, well, just how do I um, kind of quantify some of these services? Because that's eventually what's coming down the line, I think. Bob alluded to it that, um, you know, there's an outreach part of this, but that it's also really, I think, for the benefit of the tree farmers. We, you know, had lots of discussion about how do we bring this back and make this relevant to, um, to each tree farmer. So that's the kind of uh, feedback I'm interested in, um, you know, besides the, the obvious technical uh, issues we, we Kind of alluded to, we're we're kind of on a shoestring here. We're not, um, you know, using the latest technology, but um, we're trying to make improvements as we go along. So, I'd love to hear from from tree farmers and how this might have helped them kind of wrap their head around it, or um, you know, prepare for uh, what's coming down the line. One of, one of the things, and tying in with what Nick said, a couple of the tree farmers that actually took this um, survey said that after they took it, they realized um, how many things they were doing that they hadn't considered in their plan, that they didn't put in their plan. And so it was kind of interesting because part of it was, you know, kind of like a, almost like an outline to update your plan of the things that maybe you hadn't thought of that maybe you were doing. So. So, Bob, we have a question from um, Richard wanting to know what was the average acreage in the survey results? Uh, the average acre? I, I don't know. Um, Nick, do you, do you know? 
but we, I mean, we can find out. Yes, I can uh, share my screen here if you. Okay, I, I will stop sharing mine. So this is, uh, you know, summarized based on, uh, you know, how many acres are you actively managing? So um, doesn't include some of the folks. Um, but these are the uh, acreage classes and then a breakdown east side, west side, and then statewide. I don't know if that, does that help? Uh, Richard. Richard. So, so the average acres essentially on this on the sheet. I know it's a little bit confusing. So, if you look at um, the mean, the mean size was looks like from ten to forty was about twenty six acres. Um, the mean size um, from say forty one twenty was around um, seventy six. Thirty two to five thousand was the average was around uh, or one twenty to three. 320 is about 172 and um, 320 to 5,000 was around 985 and greater than 5,000 was was 43,000. I assume that's because of that's like your Maryland rings and, and those kind of places, but so yeah, Richard, does that answer your question? Okay. Okay, we got a yes out of that. So cool. Let's see what other questions are in here. Okay, I don't see any other questions. That's the only one so far. So even even. Oh, um, it, go ahead. Yeah, did we ask the endangered, endangered species? I was thinking that was a question on there. How many tree farmers had threatened and endangered species on their property? Yes, and I can I can pull that up if you want to see it. Just, yes. Um, this let me this this may take a second here because I got to find out where endangered species is. So let me pull this up first. Okay. Let's see. I'm just trying to get the question here. Um, I believe it's 13.1. Okay, great. Thank you. Of course, it's not going to work now, but let's just try and go down to it. Looks like I haven't got that one on here. Looks like I don't have 13.1 on here. I can so, say that we had so 79 uh, responses to this question, 12 of which answered, you know, that they that they were taking some sort of active management. So I can only infer from from that that 12 number that those folks know that they have. But I think there were some responses like we don't know or something to that effect, but. I can, I can get it for you. Portion. I can get it for you, Tom, um, but I don't, I don't have it in front of me. Other questions, comments?
so so what did what did so as far as doing the survey um was did you feel like it was comfortable and you were comfortable in doing it was it easy to to do was it um all those kinds of things any of those kinds of things that because these are important um just as we go along and we Okay, well, all right, if there's, um, are there other comments that people have? Um, I, and I will get the TNS thing and we can send it out to people that are on here, the answer to that one, because um, we do have it. Anything else from people? All right, then, um, I think we may have it. Um, we're about yeah, we're about ten minutes early, but about the right amount of time. Um, anyways, um, I want to thank everybody for being here. Um, it's really important for those of you that have filled out the survey. Um, I, we really appreciate it. If you know people who haven't, please let us know, and we will get the survey to them if they don't already have it. Um, again, our goal is to, um, and, and you know that's. That's one of the things that I, you know, we are going to use this information. This is not going to go by the wayside. Um, so it's, and it's really important. So um, anything else, uh, Nick or Andrea or John, that you would want to say before we close this out? Just thank you to everyone who uh, filled it out. Um, we did get a chance to read through uh, some more extensive comments and they were. They're extremely helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I'd just like to add, this is John here again. Um, we really want to, as Bob mentioned, take this forward, really develop a database, um, get refine our process, get a little better uh, system in place so that it's easier for people and they can update it over time and basically have it as a bit of an archive for the, their own use. So um, we'll be in touch with you on that. And um, if, if anybody wants to wait for a second, I'm trying to open up Google Forms to see if I can get you the information. Yeah, not gonna work. Okay, I will have to get it to you. Anyways, um, again, thank you everybody. And uh, with that, I think that's the end of our our uh, update and thank you all for doing what you've done and thank you for being great tree farmers okay